Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Exploring Kodawari. We're working on getting some new guests on the podcast, but in the meantime, Yanka and I figured we would do another episode of just the two of us deep diving into a topic that's been on our minds, of course accompanied with a glass or two of wine. And the topic for this episode is nihilism, a philosophy that more or less states that human life has no intrinsic meaning or value. I think you can explicitly be a nihilist if you just literally think that to yourself, but more often people implicitly or subconsciously seem to succumb to nihilism. And there are different forms of nihilism, moral, cosmic, political, existential, and we do talk a bit about the history of the term and those different forms of nihilism. But our goal here generally wasn't an academic exploration of nihilism or its history or what all the famous philosophers had to say about it. We do quote famous existential thinkers like Nietzsche and Camus, but overall this is more of our personal exploration of how us humans tend to struggle with existential problems. And we did split the topic into two episodes for a better flow. So in this episode, part one, we talk about Nietzsche's take on nihilism as well as our own personal struggles with it. We also give nihilism its due because there is a strong argument for it. And I think ignoring that argument, ignoring the points that nihilism actually makes, comes with its own risks. Uh, we, we also discuss whether we think nihilism is on the rise in our politics and society these days. And then in part two, which should be out soon after this episode, we talk through why one should wrestle with nihilism, again, give it its due, and then overcome it to find a more durable sense of meaning. It is kind of a heavy topic, but it also fits in perfectly with the general goal of this podcast, which is to approach the task of self-development with the Kodawari energy. In other words, aiming at the best version of yourself you can be and having the motivation to actually work towards that. And I think the struggle with nihilism gets down to the bottom layer bedrock of doing this, of figuring out who you are and what the meaning of life is. Anyways, with that lighthearted intro out of the way, thanks so much for listening and hope you enjoy our discussion on nihilism. Okay, Exploring Kodawari is finally back. Hello. You know, it's been since October. <laughs> Are you serious? Yeah, I was looking yesterday. Oh, wow. Time so, flies, I guess. Yeah. Um, we were really busy, though. So this is the first week of January. Happy mm -hmm. New Year to anyone listening. Happy New Year, Mokonju. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to come back with a banger of a topic today. It's one that was like, I, I sort of have a note file that just has all sorts of topics. Some of them I have like half developed. Some of them are just like a sentence or something. And as we were um, getting ready to travel up to Massachusetts for the holidays, I was looking through like, okay, like I want to do on the plane and like whatever on free time, I want to be directing my free time energy to another Kodawari episode because I, you know, I, it's hard to find time to do that. Yeah. Anyways, um, keep the phone away from the cable. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, and so I found this sort of like nihilism topic uh, with just a few bullet points and then kind of let it stew in my brain, blah, blah, blah. Here we are. So the, the title is something going to be something like contending with nihilism or why you should contend with nihilism. Um, I got a little bit into the philosophy and history and stuff, but I don't want this to be like an academic sense of nihilism. Yeah. So if you're hearing us speak and you're like, well, I'm technically a nihilist, but that's not at all that, you know, we're, that's not what we're talking about. Yeah, then. it's going to be more personal. I would Cause say like, I, I, a little bit of history, I guess, but yeah. a little bit of that. And, and I've seen articles by people where they're like, well, you know how sort of like atheism gets a bad name where people are like, I'm an atheist. It just means I'm starting from nothing. No assumptions about God. Mm -hmm. And then some atheists are like, ah, there is no God. Definitely. Like, yeah, you know, there's a misconception. So we want to maybe clear. So there, out. there are philosophies maybe like called pessimism or something where that might be more actively negative people. Yeah. So some nihilists out there might be very optimistic, you know, that's true. There are different Types of it, I guess. So, Optimistic nihilism. I think we're just going to talk through what we think is the brand of nihilism sort of in culture right now. And 
on a personal level as well, and then sort of how to work yourself out of it. Yeah. So can we just start with like, what do you, what do you feel personally? Just not academically or anything like that. What is your, your definition of nihilism? Um, so I think there's a mis, the biggest misconception about nihilism is it sounds like, and I like thought this was the case. It just sounds to my ear as if like, it's like believing in nothing, like just, you know, thinking everything is meaningless, blah, blah, blah. I mean, there's definitely that portion of it, but I think it is deeper than that. Also, it has lots of different branches underneath. So uh, were you ever a nihilist, like to some degree or another when you were younger or now? I mean, I think you, when I was younger, I was more of a nihilist. I I think you were too. (laughs) Like as far as I know you. Maybe when we met? Like, yeah, when we met, like, I think you were a very different person, more like a, you know, um, what's that? Whatever, I can't remember. But anyway, um, yeah, I think I would say I was more of a nihilist when I was younger. And then I think I grew out of it and then maybe became more of an absurdist. But again, I don't want to label yeah. myself well, with anything. Well, labels, are, labels yeah. get weird with this it, stuff. It gets weird. But I would say, like, if there, if it, there's a label, like, requested, that will be that. I don't consider myself a nihilist right now yeah i would say nihilism for me is like not just um accepting certain truths about the world but like having a belief system based in them you know so like i think the reason why um spoiler alert the lesson of this episode and topic is going to be you should contend with nihilism and really wrestle with it and then find your meaning um what do you think nihilism is? Why don't you tell No, me? I was trying to define that. And then like, um, I totally lost where I was going. We also didn't eat dinner. So <laughs> <laughs> we had um, like a late I lunch, think, but... I think I was trying to say like th- that when I was younger, I had more of like a, um, nothing matters kind of. It's more like a cosmic nihilism probably. Yeah, probably I guess cosmic nihilism. It was sort of like I was getting into astrophysics a lot and like, <laughs> watching videos of Neil deGrasse Tyson being passionate about the cosmos. And I sort of just found comfort in the knowledge that like the atoms of my body came from stars and I was born from dust and to dust I shall return type of thing. I mean, it's very comforting in a way. Also, like, I feel like I have moments in and out of having cosmic nihilism, especially when I see that you are this blue dot thing, you know what I mean? Every time I see that. That famous oh the like, pale blue dot yeah pale blue dot I'm pale like, blue dot Whoa. was um <laughs> like 1970 something I think right yeah Carl Sagan and a bunch of other people sent the Voyager spacecrafts out into space and they're still going by the way I know it's they have like a gold plated record of languages on Earth music like all sorts of culture yeah um and then th- they convinced the the people to turn the camera around as it was passing Saturn and take a picture of the earth. And then that made um, Carl Sagan's famous pale blue dot thing. Can you find that real quick, actually? Sure. It's like I a little paragraph remember. Of, of him speaking in Kermit voice, you know? <laughs> I still remember their picture super well, the pale blue dot. And I think it was like, you can see a little blue dot of earth through the the sort of grains of one of Saturn's rings, which are really just, you know, dust particles, rocks and whatnot, arranged in a disc. Um, did you find it? Yep, that's it. Okay, it's a little bit longer, but like I'm going to read the first paragraph maybe. So, look again at that dot. That's here. That's home. That's us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of, every human being who ever was lived out of their, out their lives. The aggregate of our joy and suffering, thousands of confident religions, ideologies and economic doctrines, every hunter and forager, every hero and coward, Every creator and destor- destroyer of civilization. I think we got the point. But every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species live there on the moat of dust suspended in a sunbeam. Yeah. It's very powerful. So is Earth like your, what we feel it as right now? We're in our apartment, whatever, right? Or is it a tiny piece of dust suspended in, in thin air, so to speak, in the not air of space, you know? So that induced a sort of cosmic nihilism when I was younger Mm -hmm. where I started taking myself a lot less seriously. Mm -hmm. I started taking things that happened to me a lot less seriously. So 
you have a bad audition or a bad concert and you just sort of laugh it off and just go like, you know. I mean, I think it's important to be able to do that. That's not entirely attached to nihilism. I'm saying that's, that, that was my path to I being see. able to do that at that age mm -hmm. is sort of like, wait, I'm just one note in this big symphony. Like, because I just watched a documentary last night about the origins of the universe and mm -hmm. inflation and at, you know, one fortieth of a second after the big bang, you know, stuff like that. And you're just like... <laughs> yeah, I'm really going to like complain about whatever, you know. Mm -hmm. But it also was a little bit nihilistic. It's sort of like a nothing matters in this giant universe. I'm just a small part of it. It'll all just be chaos and randomness yeah. one day again. For me, it was very comforting yet, yeah, nihilistic at the same time. But I was in and out of it. I never fully, I think, was a nihilist. I always had... No, it, it, the nihilism would be more like what you <laughs> said, what you say, you know. Yeah. I think... Uh, if you look at our behavior, we were just definitely still believing in some some stuff, right? Yeah, for sure. um, but this is sort of like an Alan Watts. He's like a spiritual philosopher. And he, he sort of talks about reality being a playful dance and not some serious stage of drama, right? Or Kurt Vonnegut. Actually, right on the coffee mug, I drink coffee out of every morning, right? It has a bunch of Kurt Vonnegut quotes. And the one of them on there is like, we are just here to fart around. Fart around. I love that. So that's sort of like a playful nihilism. It's not like, oh, nothing matters, therefore I'm going to be a dick to everyone. But it's more like, you know, reality is a dance, you know, sort of like you look at the yin and the yang and around it spins. It's not one battling the other. They're dancing with each other. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's still somewhere in the background of my um, sort of nihilism part of my brain. But I think the thing that is more the topic of this episode is more of like a existential nihilism mm -hmm. and maybe a little bit of like a moral relativism, moral nihilism. We'll get into that. But mm -hmm. um, I think the big philosophers we'll talk about are going to be Nietzsche and Camus. Mm -hmm. And Camus is uh, what you were mentioning, absurdism, yeah. right? Um, the term, let's just get into the term. Okay. Nihil, right? Latin um, is the root of the word, meaning mm -hmm. nothing, right? Think about the word annihilate, right? Yeah. So what exactly it means in a philosophy that is up for debate, but let's not make this a philosophy lecture type thing, but more of like a personal thing for sure. Um, so the definition of existential... Um, Nihilism, I would say, is the idea that human life has no intrinsic meaning or value. Yeah, that's very harsh. <laughs> well, it it the, it says intrinsic, meaning it it doesn't come with the the software. It doesn't come with the ticket of being a human. Yeah, it's not like it's just there. Mm -hmm. Nietzsche, for example, would admit that and then say, um, you know, so we have to find it it within ourselves, kind of thing. Yeah. Um, Nietzsche kind of saw the rise of nihilism as, I think, uh, the, the, the intellect going too far. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. Like, um, what does the intellect do? It starts to explore truth, right? And then you get like enlightenment type thinking where we have like scientific thinking and eventually that kind of intellectually, logically rigorous, prickly way of thinking about the world, you start to question even the very foundational values, you know, like you start to question everything, yeah, including truth, right? Yeah. The, the sort of assumptions under the culture, which at the time were based in Judeo-Christian um, assumptions about, you know, God and your soul and your, the meaning to your life and everything. Yeah. I mean, his famous quote, the God is dead, you know. There's more of a one. warning. Yeah. Not in the sense that the intellect shouldn't kill God, but in the sense that, something will come rushing in its place. Mm -hmm. And he was pretty, pretty freaking right about that in terms of like the 20th, 20th century and like two major ideologies that filled in people's lack of meaning at the time, I guess you could say mm -hmm. like communism on one, on one side and then Nazism on the, on the other side, mm -hmm. if, if there's a side to that. Uh, yeah. um, Cause I think one of the things that is the risk of, secretly being a nihilist without admitting it to yourself or like without fixing it 
is you're very susceptible to something coming along and taking over your brain. Yeah. You, you, you like an ideology politically or uh, some cult, right? Yeah. You know how some people like they say like, actually, my friends used to say this about me like. You know, let's keep an eye on Luke. Don't let him go to anything that might resemble a cult. Because <laughs> like my brain's just, I don't know, very curious. And like, that's how cults get you. You just have you to do. be a little curious and then you get stuck in their web if, if yeah. whatever it is. And you need to go down in rabbit holes. That's I'm a rabbit hole do. type of guy. <laughs> <laughs> um, what's the Nietzsche quote here? Uh, mm. He's talking about how like, life is too much suffering that if you don't have some framework mm -hmm. to put it into some like hero's journey, some religious story, some mythology that it's just too much to handle, you know? True. Um, but I think he also says that, that people are scared to uh, sort of go inside and find their highest self and, and therefore find their meaning. He says, uh, we, however, want to become those we are, human beings who are new, unique, incomparable, who give themselves laws, who create themselves. It's very similar to Jung's idea of like um, individuation, mm -hmm. like completely integrating the shadow and your specific qualities into your, your mind, not just being a puppet for ideas. Um, but Nietzsche also said in Human All Too Human about how, why people fail at, you know, becoming their unique individuals. Quote, they fear their higher self because when it speaks, it speaks demandingly. That's so true. And it's so easy to just ignore that. And then I feel like that's the reason why a lot of people don't really realize they're aiming for at nihilism at heart. Or maybe or, they think they're part of themselves is being nihilist because it's harder to be the, the other thing. It's more, more responsibilities. Very true. And it sort of feeds on your laziness, right? Yeah. I mean, we all are guilty at that, like to a certain extent, I oh, feel Oh, for like. sure. I think Especially the pro problem is when you codify it into like, you start making excuses for it. Like it, when I'm lazy, like which happens all the time, it was something as simple as like not doing the dishes before going to bed, right? <laughs> Where like the voice crosses your mind. You're like, I could do five, 10 minutes right now. I go to bed with a cleaner house, a cleaner mind, you know, you know, all the ways it's going to be good. And then you kind of just like stand there for a second and go, eh, and just go to bed. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's somewhat of a sort of a quick little gesture at nihilism, right? Yeah. But I don't then not do the dishes. And then as I'm walking away, go, cause it doesn't matter anyways, you know, all dishes will be dirty eventually. <laughs> you know, true. Like, yeah. There's some awareness there. And I think the important thing is to have the awareness on larger scale decisions you know what i mean and i think maybe some people the more fail important at that the decision the more, yeah, yeah. exactly like the more you should make sure you're not ignoring that higher self yeah. that higher voice whatever which i think is an issue i think in society but we'll get there or not we'll see so nietzsche definitely like in sort of classic philosophy stuff you can read him grappling with nihilism um, and then his way out of it was that individuation thing, sort of going within, finding your unique self and fully integrating with that, listening to your higher self. And, you know, that's your meaning, right? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know exactly what I think about that. I know that um, I think you could frame it in a bunch of different ways, like stoicism we talked about a few episodes ago. That's like a philosophy of life. For me, I think if you want to really avoid being nihilist, you just have to have a philosophy of life. Have thought through like, what are you doing here? What's the goal? Yeah. Or what's, what are a few goals, you know? And then you have a direction, which is the meaning. Without that, then things start to get weird really fast. Something like that. Yeah. I think for me, it's like the... What gets tricky is the contradiction that like we all hopefully all internally have that, you know, that we are like conscious beings. So like, therefore, I feel like that's a meaning, you know what I mean? That's very meaningful. That's significant to me when I look around. But then when I look at it like in a larger scale, my personal existence 
doesn't really make a huge change, you know what I mean? So, Or does it? Or it does, I don't know. Take but, something like the butterfly effect, which is like this idea that in the complicated web of reality of like causes and effects, even something as small as the flutter of a butterfly wing can change the course of events, you know? Yeah, perhaps. So if a, if, a, if a completely nihilist position would be to say, who cares, nothing matters, nothing I do matters, eventually it'll all be nothing, right? Um, the opposite of that would be everything I do matters. And yeah. that's, that's actually really intimidating. It is. To think as you go about your day, like you're having a question to yourself, like this really matters in how things work out. And I think that can become pathological. Like you'll just be frozen. Like, should I open the door now or in two seconds? Like, you know, <laughs> sometimes I think that like when I'm about to open my car door, when like cars are passing or bikers or something, I just think like I was about to just open the door and I can sort of see that branch of reality where... I almost just like got my door clipped off by that car. Or <laughs> I almost just crashed my car because I was lost in thought. You know, you can sort of see the branches of reality right when you decide certain things. That's true. Yeah. But if you're frozen with every decision, like this matters so much. I What do I do? And you become cheaty, basically. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can have yeah, yeah, cheaty from, um, what, what is that? Uh, the Good Place. The Good Place. He's like this philosopher character who's just always stuck and can't decide because he's like weighing a thesis paper on each side of every decision, like what to get for lunch, you know? <laughs> so that's bad, I think, in that sense. But if you were to think like just with every crossroads of decision you get to, when there's an element of like good, bad to it, you know, like good and evil, yeah. like this would be the more moral decision. They say the devil stands at the crossroads. Yeah. It means it stands right at the point where you make a decision. Not The devil's not down there once you've made like a thousand bad decisions. I mean, he's there too, but he's tempting you at the crossroads, right? Yeah. Oh, I'll just have one cookie. If you're like told yourself, I'm not having any cookies. You're you know? my uncle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Yanka's uncle sneaks off uh, okay. to the bathroom to eat cookies. <laughs> we caught him. <laughs> um, would you say nihilism is on the rise? I know we're young. It's not like we're 70 and can think across a few generations and try to average it, but... Yeah, don't get me to answer that. It's very tricky. You know what I mean? I think it... Well, I was so I was asking you just like, you know, you were younger, you were now older. Sometimes the view on that changes very radically, especially I found around age 30, like you sort of start thinking thoughts like, oh, those young people, not like, you know, we're all kids. I feel like it's on the rise in a way that people like it's masked you know what i mean people mask it with certain with involving themselves with certain purposes but i think underneath that is like it's emerging from nihilism it's so it's, i mean that probably mm. didn't make any sense but. i think i totally understood you you're saying like <laughs> people are acting like nihilists but saying they're not like saying there's something else. yes i feel like they're acting like they're serving for a bigger cause but in the end, when you actually kind of see what's fueling see, them, yeah, or like what, what's underneath, try to see what's fueling. It's them. just there's no substance, or maybe I'm too old school. I don't know. I'm Turkish. Like we have still values and you know culture, all that. So I feel like when yeah. I look around, I'm missing some sense of meaning. There's a sense actions. of detachment from culture. Yeah. In other words, like you should. In we, Western we, cultures, I don't know if this is everywhere. Like, I'm not answering on behalf of my country. No, I, I mean more just generally. Like, you need a, a rule system to help you guide guide yourself through the world, right? Mm -hmm. To interpret the world. That's what <laughs> Nietzsche was talking about. Like, if we just get rid of our interpretive structure, meaning if we just try to pay attention to the entire world, there's too many facts out there. It's just too much to handle. Um, and so we need a sort of interpretive structure tell us what to pay attention to. When you go out and walk through the, the road, you see like monkey people <laughs> walking on two legs. You see like cats, you see cars, you see these categories of relevant objects. Like that tells you how to see the world. You don't see most of what you see. Most of it's just information you never, you know, codify into a memory. Mm -hmm. And then we need that same thing on the big scale of like, what's the meaning of our life kind of questions. Yeah. And culture sort of helps with that, you know, like people are programmed to 
meet someone, get married, start a family, buy a house, you know, like do these checkpoints in your life that are just, they, they make you feel like you're on the right path because our culture has sort of programmed us this way. Yeah. Sometimes that's bad if that rule could be better, but, but we need something, right? That's true. There, I think the most dangerous one is when you're doing it in autopilot, not necessarily sitting down and oh, yeah, thinking yeah. what is the, as you said, like, yeah. What 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 people is, follow that culture so other, uh, otherwise like it's very meaningful I think too like if that's what you wish in life like we all live wanting to like inherit something to the future like we want to like leave our mark in the world like that's, that's a common like people, yeah thing people say which I think is not a bad thing it's not it's rooted in sometimes some selfishness like I want my name to be known but it's it can be also like they want to help the future it can be as simple as just having kids. Like that, that's yeah, what yeah. I mean. And, that it's both selfish yeah. and not selfish, you know? Yeah. And what I'm trying to say is like, if you come to that conclusion by going through all these, then go for you. But a lot of the times it's in autopilot somewhat. But anyway. Well, I think a lot of people, like you said, they're pretending to have certain like deep goals. Like you see this in social justice movements and whatever, whatever pe- woke ideology is supposed to be. That word gets used so much as to just confuse anybody who... You know, people don't necessarily know what what it means, but for me, it means the sort of nihilism philosophy that's guiding a lot of what's happening in the world right now. Sort of in academic terms, it would be like postmodernism. Postmodernism. Mm-hmm. Um, there, it's sort of like a relativism, like you know, everything is relative. That's absolutely true, <laughs> or there is no absolute truth. And that's my absolute truth, you know, um, or like, you know, meaning is just made up or something, you know, like those kinds of thoughts, like, you know, Mm -hmm. there's no meaning to meaning, you know, sort of saying that like, it's, it's sort of right that we make everything up to some extent. Even science has to make assumptions to get you have to assume that objective reality exists and then you can start to build the structures of science. But underneath everything is some kind of assumption, you know? Have you heard of like infinite regression? No. It, it's the classic like, you know, dad, why is the sky blue? Oh, you know, it's the nitrogen. Why does nitrogen make the sky oh, blue? And I see. And G.E. Moore came up with this in morality uh, just to say like, you know, we have to assume good is good. <laughs> You know, you have to lift at least one word or concept up by its own straps to get the whole thing going, you know? Mm -hmm. Oh, you told your friend that you would help them move this weekend, but now something else came up and you don't really want to go. What should you do? Well, to a real nihilist, they would say, I'm just going to go have fun. Like, what's the difference? Like, nobody will remember that I did that in, you know, (laughs) a couple hundred years or in one year, you know, whatever that... Yeah, and I know people like that. I do know people like Me that. Me too, that, <laughs> unfortunately. That will just sort of um, <laughs> sort of shrug off moral responsibility like that. That's true. And I think it's some kind of deep down nihilism that um, does that, you I know? I think so. And I think it's very dangerous to have that. And at the same time, I cannot identify or like, I feel like I can't empathize with it because there's something in me that's mm. like driving i can like, empathize sorry. with the wrestle part, i mean i can't like the, the sort of like darkness part but um, me too but i just like never see myself like letting I've anyone never... in such a crucial like i'm not moving an apartment per se but well, you know in that what example I, mean. I i guess i was building to the questions of like and then i convince you like yanka you should really go help your friend move and and then you go like why should yanka help her friend move and your answer could be any number of things it could be like um just purely utilitarian like oh i want to do this favor for my friend so that i can cash in a favor from them you know yeah i mean and that, if someone said that to you you'd be like fuck you don't help me move then you know yeah i know some for some people it works like that for me no, it's I think, so hard to explain but it's just something inside of me is just like oh this is the right thing to do Okay, so knows what that is? I, so I'm definitely not a nihilist. I think that's my point. Is like there's some kind of deep um, uh, assumption or intuition in, in, inside you, like sort of like a um, 
an honor code thing. That's like, I said I would do this, yeah. therefore I will do this. Yeah, that's, that's um, cool. It would have to be a crazy emergency that gets you to, to not do it, you know? I, I agree. I think the infinite gr- regression thing is to say, I could keep asking you further questions and say, well, you know, let's say you answered, well, I want to help my friend. She's my friend and I want to make her life easier. Well, why do you want to make her life easier? Well, because I think it's good to make people's lives easier. Why is it good to be good? (laughs) You know, you (laughs) always will get to this question of like, well, I want to lessen people's suffering and make their lives, whatever, it could take you 10 questions. Why is it good to be good? And then you have to sort of get the whole thing up with an assumption. I think that's um, the kind of intuition uh, that gets things like morality and life meaning and stuff off the ground. And we'll talk a little bit later about like why that's, why that might be and like why it's okay. But I think that's what's missing when I look at sort of um, protest movements and social justice type movements and a lot of the woke stuff is if you just sort of don't react to it and just watch it, what seems to be fueling it more than it's definitely partially fueled by a desire to want to help the world and make yeah, the world a that's, better place. That's what's so tragic. But it's covering up like, a lot of darkness. I feel like a lot of people are going along. That's what's so tragic is like they're going along with the wish to make things better, which is just beautiful, you know? That just makes so much sense to me. But then the more I look at it, I feel like it's corrupted by certain... It seems to be more coming from the shadow than yeah. from the light. And I'm not saying people go along knowingly like you know what i mean no i feel like at least most most people yeah some really darker people probably do sort of feel the fuel from darker motivations and then just go with it anyways i mean i think most people they sort of um don't want to look down into the darkness of the human condition of their own personal life of you know, maybe they haven't found a meaning to life or, I mean, like, I'll be perfectly honest, like us being married now, that really solves a lot of that meaning of life questions within your brain. Mm -hmm. As we talked about in the marriage episode, the idea of like, you're getting married, you hold a candle above yourselves and that's the light and you serve the light. Mm -hmm. And I think when you have a life mission, like you're serving something above you, especially if it's the light, you know? Um, that can really give your life a lot of clarity. You're serving something that isn't your own ego and you don't have to get stuck in that sort of like cycle of the ego falling in love with itself and creating the perfectly logical, you know, trap for itself, you know? Yeah. Um, so I, I, I think it's sort of that relativity and, and weirdness like that that's ruling a lot of just popular culture right now like all the ways it's popular to sound like you're just a really good person because you you do this or do that you know it's also like you you tend to abuse logic and truth when Mm -hmm. when you're in one of that that's for me i think how i figured out that that a lot of wokeism or social justice type um energies are are fueled by more darkness is that if you watch the way they use language it's very manipulative. It's very like shifting definitions of things constantly. It's very gaslighty, like always accusing other people of what they're doing. And these are all techniques of like very left brain, non-spiritual like perspectives that aren't open to updating, but very stuck in Mm. certain patterns. To me, I think what's not okay, meaning like a little alarming is how... Like they, I'm, I don't want to obviously assume everybody is like this, but most of the people can't hold any other form of idea or just oh, opinion yeah. with compassion in their minds. That's my biggest issue. There's just constant rage, like immediately, like respond with rage, like just like, oh, you know, immediately opposing, like immediately just being like, of course, like that's what it is. Like what I say is like what I, I don't want to obviously say everybody's like this. But it's so sure. It's very confident. Yeah, it's very confident. And I'm like, I've never been but so confident with think- anything that I believe or say, like, or I think anybody that within reason ever. 
I think Where? that's sort of like what what's happened, like we said earlier, is that when faced with the darkness of nihilism, if you don't sort of fully contend with it and use that as your growth as a human, then something like an ideology will come in and fill in the gaps. And, and again, as I said, a lot really of the sure. times... I think it happens very unknowingly, like those most people. Most of the time, yeah, I would most say. Most of the time. Most of the time. That's why like, I totally... It feels good to be sure and right about things. It's very good to be also unified under certain ideas. Like, that's a very nice feeling. Oh, you it, wanna it gets seek... rid of anxiety. Yeah, yeah, of course. It gets rid of, like, the anxiety of having to figure out things for yourself. Like, you just go along with what's already been figured out. Although, you know, one way you can spot somebody under the spell of more of an ideology, if they're more captured by ideas rather than like genuinely creating individual ideas, like Mm -hmm. giving you information that's fueled by knowledge, but also their own life experiences. You know, you can tell when someone's genuinely creating knowledge in the moment and Mm -hmm. speaking truth. Versus when they're just reciting some memorized ideology yeah. that they were programmed Which with. happens a lot around me, I think. I'm oh, so yeah. Sorry I mean, for that's saying why this, I think this I question, is nihilism on the rise? The answer is like, yeah. And <laughs> I, I mean... I mean, it's complicated. I didn't live through the 70s or 60s or 80s. Like, there were a lot of... T- I can't say how it compares to... There's probably generally, but different types so like different different manifestations different like flavors yeah we were watching like something stupid obviously 60s is not just mad men but like watching that show for instance gave a completely different flavor of nihilism for instance or at least a struggle so like well i think that was like sort of almost like a bojack horseman deals with nihilism like don draper was dealing with that question like what's the meaning of life what if it has no meaning? Or you know? every character in that show, like a woman in that show, were dealing yeah. with that. Yeah, they like, all were to some very, degree. Yeah, that was a very weird Oh, at time, least certainly Betty was. You know? Women, generally, I think. Like Betty and all of her friends again. Like, I just meant I felt like Betty like specifically, specifically saw the darkness more than Trudy. Oh, yeah. We should do a Mad Men episode really all, all on its own. <laughs> we have to rewatch it, though. We should. I, I missed that show. I love that show. It's a great show. Yeah. Anyway, um. um So, you know, I think you can tell when someone's under the spell of an ideology because you just genuinely and calmly ask them questions and they'll only be able to get like one or two, maybe three layers deep of question answering about why they think what they think. Before they progressively get angrier at you. Sometimes they just get angry because they can see you're sort of just playfully poking at their knowledge structure. And I'm not saying do this in like a trolling kind of way. I just mean like... It should be genuinely interesting when somebody has arrived at a different view of the world than you. And we can learn to just more playfully ask each other things. And and um, if you find that you have been taken over by an ideology, meaning you're sort of just always searching for things you can say to be right, rather than absorbing knowledge, sitting with it, being open and seeing where your instinct guides you, you know? Um, the, the first version is very left brain. The ego starts to worship itself. It's like, how can I sound smarter? <laughs> Whereas the second way might be more of like a um, letting the wisdom of your right brain. Ian McHillchrist has that book, The Master and His Emissary. And he talks so much about how the right brain is the part that's open to updating. It's open to chaos. It's open to new ideas, you know? Mm-hmm. And I think when you do that, then... Um, you you don't fall under the trap of of an ideology so easily. You can sort of feel a more obvious meaning to life, even though your left brain has logically arrived at the conclusion of nihilism. Because that's what happens is you start to get older, you start to get smarter, maybe you read some philosophy, and you're like, yeah, there is no meaning to life. Like, it's all just made up, you know? And maybe you read postmodern philosophy and you start thinking like, oh, it's all just evil badly motivated human beings seeking out power and everything's just a power game and a manipulation. And I think that's just a very nihilistic view of the world because human beings are like that, but we're also fueled by love. And if you ignore that, that light part of our instinct that I think does naturally come if you just quiet your mind and, you know, don't act or think that you know everything, but actually just you're just open to what's there 
I think generally more loving motivations come. If you're like, what should I do? Should I help my friend move this weekend <laughs> or not? Like, I, I think if you're quiet, like if, if you sit on the edge of your bed, you could structure it like a prayer, but you don't have to be praying to a God in the sky. You can be praying to like your deeper wisdom of your subconscious. You just, what should I do? Or you don't even have should to I be... go pleasure myself? Mm-hmm. Like, you know, by going to the party that I want to go to and, and drinking and having fun, or should I go help that really boring friend I don't like that, but I promised I would help them. You know, it could you make the scenario, <laughs> it's whatever. It's getting oddly specific. <laughs> no, I'm not thinking of anyone. I'm honestly. kidding, obviously. Um, uh, my point is like the answer is obvious if you, if you genuinely ask your higher self that question, yeah. you know, and I think that's just the same with meaning. Mm-hmm. Um, what are we at? 38. We can make this like a, a part, part two, um, like end of part one and then we go to part two. Okay. Maybe a quick bathroom break, pour another glass of wine. Cool. Um, <coughs> yeah. So I think nihilism is on the rise just to conclude this part. Yeah. Um, remember in our chaos and order episode, a few episodes ago, we talked about like, like the moral nihilism or sort of moral relativism would be like, oh yeah, it's all chaos and order. Like why not aim at the chaos, you know? I mean, also there are a lot of, like one last thing, a lot of other reasons for nihilism to be on the rise as well. I feel like people are so lonely. Like they've been like never been this lonely. And there's lots of different reasons for that. There's like an illusion of loneliness and at the same time, like togetherness. You know what I mean? I feel like- We evolved to be in small, tight groups of, of tightly bonded people, you know, working together. Yeah. And and so it's so easy to be not that at all, to just be like more feeling by yourself, like only connecting through social media and That's electronics. What I, mean. and I think like social media give you, gives you the illusion of being togetherness, but when you don't have the actual... Something in your psychology doesn't believe you, yes, you know. Yes, exactly. Maybe you could think of it like the difference between using like a a bright lamp in the winter to get sunlight versus actually getting oh, sunlight, yeah, yeah, that's you know. That's very true. So I think like that's definitely part of it. So I don't want to want, I didn't want to end this without mentioning that. I think that's. And I also think that there's a lot of suffering and tragedy right now, specifically with, you know, we're going through growing pains culturally, you know, yeah. it's, we're sort of, if you zoom out, you could, I was listening to this Zen monk guy and he was kind of saying, we're in this big, like, whatever you want to call it, we we don't know what to call it because we're in the middle of it. Transition period, sort of modernism and postmodernism have to have their reckoning. And like, where are we going to go with this? Are we going to keep some culture that helps us keep living? Are we going to destroy ourselves? You know, it's unclear. He also thinks that there's a, a, a sort of nihilism feeling what's going on in culture right now. But he also said there's an intense narcissism feeling it. And maybe that's partly because we were growing up much more separated from other humans, not sort of in our more basic tribal, the you know, where we evolved, you know. Very complicated. Again, I think all of these things we're talking about are applying to Western cultures. It's well, very yeah, different. It applies to different so. places in different ways, but obviously Western culture being as widespread as it is. That's true. Western culture created the the intellect that would end up being the thing that destroys it, right? Yeah. It's sort of like, um, almost like mythological, you know, like the enlightenment and the intellect. Mm-hmm. This is what Nietzsche said in the in the beginning when we quoted, um, you know, that the intellect eventually comes to question truth itself and all of the uh, fundamental assumptions that even have it existing, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, okay, yeah. so let's, let's leave it there. <laughs> Um, I think that kind of nihilism is sort of like the, all right, like, uh, you know, you'll be dead. Then everyone, you know, will be dead. Like, what will it matter? And, um, I guess in part two, we're going to try to argue why it will matter, why it can matter, why it does matter and sort of how to, how to build meaning for yourself. Yep. Sound good. Okay. See you in one minute, Yanka, and maybe in like a week, people listening. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Thanks for listening to this episode of Exploring Kodawari. 
If you enjoyed it, we hope you'll consider sharing it on social media and with friends. You can also help us out by leaving a rating and a review wherever you listen to podcasts. Those help us more than you would think. And if you'd like to help us out in a more substantial way, consider going over to our website to make a donation through PayPal. Links are in the episode notes for this. You can do this as a one-time donation or a recurring monthly donation. All of that support will help us to set aside time in order to create content for the podcast and the blog. And finally, please get in touch with us and say hi, either on social media or privately through email. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks for listening and see you next time.